Okay, well, thank you very much, um, uh, Stephen, for organizing this great week. I recognize that I'm the last speaker, and it's early on a Saturday morning after a long week. Um, so thank you all for being here. And so I feel it's my job then to be provocative. And I'm going to go out on many limbs here this morning. Um, and I hope I don't fall off. But I think the, the idea here is to get us thinking deeply about um, the bases of inequality. Okay? All right. So let's, let's start off with you know, a basic question. Why do we care about inequality? Now, I know you've been doing this all week long, and I'm sure other people have raised this question. You know, why, are, why are we here for the week? And I'm going to give you perhaps a slightly different answer. I'm not sure. I didn't see everyone who came before me, but a, perhaps a slightly different answer than what people have given before. So first of all, you know, what's inequality? And with all due respect to everybody who spends their careers measuring inequality, and trying to understand it, you know, basically some people have more and some people have less. Okay, that's inequality. Well, again, why do we care about it? Well, as social scientists, we're potentially interested in describing such patterns. You know, that's what we do. We describe society. But why do we concentrate on inequality as a pattern of interest? I mean, why is that something that we here collectively care about? Well, as economists, we might care about it because it might be bad for growth or bad for development. So we worry about whether inequality leads to better or worse um, GDP per capita, for example. Okay, so we might be concerned about that. But maybe we're concerned about it, and I have a suspicion there's a lot of us here in the room, we're concerned about it because maybe we think it's somehow unfair or unjust. Somehow we don't like it, okay, that some people have more and some people have less. And I'm not going to be too specific about what I mean by unfair or unjust, right? But I think we have a sense that somehow we look out there in the world and we say, this isn't right. So, and it may be particularly unjust or unfair when these inequalities seem to be somehow systematic in the sense that certain people in certain groups within society have more and others have less. So we look out there in the world and we say, you know, this is actually really unfair because Roma in Hungary seem to be doing particularly badly, for example. Okay, so I'm going to try and sprinkle my talk, actually, with examples that are not from the United States. Because I know that many here are, are interested in you know, inequality in various contexts. So the basic point is that inequality isn't randomly distributed. We don't look out there in a particular economy and say, well, it's just random who has more and who has less. No, it's not. It's actually systematic. In the United States, of course, we talk a lot about African Americans. I have a typo. We talk now about Hispanics. In Europe, we talk about North Africans or Africans or the Roma, right? And in many parts of the world, we talk about women, that women team seem to be earning less, doing less well, and so on, maybe having worse health outcomes. So again, the point is, is that inequality is not somehow just randomly distributed across the population, but actually we do see these systematic patterns. And of course, we recognize that in all, all of our studies. So again, what I now want to bring us to is trying to think about that point seriously. What we've just done is we've started to talk about people in social terms, in terms of social categories. And that brings us right to the word identity. So identity, at a minimum, is a designator of a social group. So I've used these words, women, North Africans, Roma, so forth, right? So we're already starting to use identity as a, as a distinction between people within society. And we're labeling people in particular ways. So at a minimum, identity is a designator of a social group. But we want to go further than that. We don't just want to say, oh, we're going to call these people women and see what happens. We want to think about how identity figures into inequality. Is it merely a descriptor? You know, do we just merely run our regressions and have you know, a beta term for women or a dummy variable for women? Or do we actually try and think about how identity is part of a process that creates and sustains inequality? Do we want to think about it more deeply than just as there are these groups out there and they, we see differences? Okay. So what I want to do today is first have a small discussion about why we should think about identity and inequality. Then I'm going to give a discussion about some economic theory. So how do we as economists build our models that lead to in unequal outcomes? Okay, so it's a little bit of an overview of micro theory, but with a sense of how we understand inequality. 
So, um, and I want to introduce identity economics, clearly, as a new approach. So first I'm going to give you a general overview, and then I'm going to give you two specific models, or three actually. One is the Coate and Lowry model. Actually, that's wrong. It's not Coate and Lowry anymore. I changed it. Uh, but you'll see later. And so I'm going to go over some Akerlof and Cranton models. The second thing I want to do is talk about experiments on inequality. And here I want to make the basic point that if you look out there in the experimental literature and economics, there's a lot of discussion about preferences for fairness or, in fact, inequity aversion. So we see this wonderful results that, you know what, people actually don't like inequality. You see all these results out there. And um, that to me seems rather puzzling because, again, we look out there in society and in economies and we see an enormous amount of inequality. So, you know, how do we reconcile these experimental results where people seem to be wanting to give so much to other people, yet in, you know, economies that we can look around in the world, actually there's an enormous amount of inequality, right? So here's a question. Do people actually have preferences for inequality? The other way around, instead of thinking about people being inequity averse, are there some people who are perhaps inequity loving? They like having more money than other people. And the answer to that is yes, we are going to see that there are people out there who actually like having more money than other people. So the answer to that is yes. And here I just want to raise, it's going to come up later, just want to just introduce this. I'm not going to delve into it very much. But if we're in a world where some people have preferences for having more than other people, then how do we talk about welfare economics? What do we do when people enjoy having more than someone else? Whose preferences and whose utility do we, you know, do we, um, do we privilege in our welfare analysis? Right? Some people have more, some people less. The people who have more like it. They like having more. So if we just are weighting utilities, what do we do with that? Right? What do we do with the utility of people who actually like having more than other people? Okay, so I think we have a basic challenge here in what I'm going to be talking about for welfare economics. Okay. How do you define an inequality? Is it just an inequality being respect to income? Yes, that's in my experiment. In the experiments, that's what I'm going to do. So there's going to be a very precise definition of what is inequality here. Okay. Um, Great, so let's launch on. So actually, before I start, are there any questions? Yeah. So with fairness, um, what do you think inequality of inequity would probably have to do with just the distribution of allocations to fairness also? So the notion of how there has to be that large, whether it was random or whether Well, again, so the, the, in experiments, we're able to control for that. We're able to ask, you know, how did somebody get to be in a position of privilege? And in some experiments, you can actually manipulate that. Right, so um, I think that we as economists aren't particularly good about, um, or how can I say this? Maybe we are good. So I have a lot of quotes sprinkled through my talk. You see I've got these quotes here about fairness, quotes around inequity aversion, quotes over inequality. That, those quotes there um, are kind of indicating that the word fairness can actually refer to a number of different economic phenomena or preferences. And we as economists, what we tend to do is we tend to write something down formally. And so we have the mathematics. And I take this mathematical object and I call it fairness. Okay? And then this word fairness can then apply to different things. So then when I as a researcher have a particular uh, relationship I want to describe, I have to use a word that has not already been used to mean something else, and so then I have to create a new word. And so, so in economics, we actually have the ability to go from the word to the math. And so then I'll be very precise about what I mean by fairness in, a, in the context of a model. But in general, when we talk, when we, so if we have these cross-disciplinary conversations, as many of you may have, so I use the word fairness, I know what it means in the context of my model, and then I talk to a bunch of social psychologists, and they say, oh, no, no, that's not fairness. Fairness is something else. And I say, yeah, okay. But it's this. So in, in the context of what we do as economists, we can precisely define what's behind the, the words. Okay? So I've got quotes around lots of different words here, indicating they can have a variety of different meanings. Okay. All right, so first I want to um, discuss why, you know, why should we be thinking deeply about economic theory? 
So why should we be trying to understand how economists build models in order to tackle questions of inequality? Okay. So putting identity or social category markers is standard practice in the empirical study of socioeconomic outcomes. So we've seen, I'm sure you've seen many examples of that this week. You have dummy variables or interaction effects which indicate the differences of the processes for black, female, ethnicity, region, state, and so on. Okay? And so again, we can empirically observe these differences. So to fix ideas, I'm sure you've seen many um, discussions this week about education. So there's the phenomenon, say, that a child or adolescent underachieves in school. So this child or adolescence, again, you see all my quotes, uh, underachieves in school, and what I mean by that here is to not get the education that would be predicted by the benefits and costs, right? So somehow we look out there at the wages a kid could earn versus the cost of attending school or the opportunity cost, and somehow we think these kids are not doing what they should according to our economic models. And so there's, again, many examples, black kids in the United States, Roma kids in Hungary, many girls. So what's going on? Um, what can account for these dummy variables and the interaction effects? And exactly what theory does is start to unpack that black box. So that's the primary, you know, sort of on the surface reason. We want to unpack the black box of what we see in the empirical work. So how do we unpack the black box? Well, we start building models. So the very basic economic model would be somewhat along the lines of the models we saw yesterday. I'm going to give you two different approaches along the lines we saw yesterday in the models of discrimination that Chris um, that Chris presented. So in a basic economic model, which you all learn in Econ 101 or in your first year of the PhD class, uh, for first year of the, P the PhD program, you start out with individuals that have some sort of utility function and then they have utility which derives from their own choices or their own actions. Individuals have idiosyncratic preferences, so they like doing certain things, they don't like doing other things. They um, like bananas, or they like oranges, or they like certain kinds of leisure, and these preferences are assumed to be exogenous. And this individual is in a, an economy where there's particular technology, which one can view as, say, for example, the inputs to education that don't come from the child themselves, and we call that technology. And then we look at individual choices, and these choices lead to patterns of behavior. Okay? Right? So that's a very, very standard economic model. There's an individual that has utility, Utilities comes from this person's preferences. This person is making some sort of constrained decision. Constrained here meaning, you know, given the other institutions or environment in which they're operating, so that gives them a set of constraints. And that leads to choices, and these choices then have these particular patterns of behavior. So then we can expand this basic model to include strategic interaction. And now the individual doesn't only have payoffs or utility from their own actions, but they have payoffs or utility from other people's actions. So this can be strategic interaction as in a game. It could also be social interaction. So I have utility or payoffs from what other people do, not only from what I do. So this is just a basic external. You can think of this as externalities. But then we can expand that, that I may actually act in a particular way, thinking about how other people may act. So then it becomes a game, strategic interaction. So in, in a situation where individuals have payoffs from own and other actions, um, people are going to be acting optimally given what they do and what other people do. But we're still maintaining the idea that individuals have these idiosyncratic preferences or idiosyncratic costs and benefits from own and others' actions, right? So I have my payoff function, and my payoff function now has my own actions and other people's actions in it. And then I optimize. And the game form um, gives the institution, so it specifies the information asymmetries, the rules of the game, and so on, right? And that's, again, considered to be exogenous. So you specify the environment in which these, these um, players are interacting. And then we have equilibria. So instead of individual choice, we now have equilibria. And the equilibrium gives rise to patterns of behavior. So in, in some sense, in terms of what was discussed yesterday, we can think of this as sort of the basic models of discrimination. And then, then this would be, an, in this example, um, strategic interaction might give um, the sort of statistical discrimination models or signaling models. And I'm going to get to some of those later. OK, so you see how we're building up. First, we have the individual with preferences and constraints, and the individual optimizes. 
Now we have the individual with preferences and constraints, but the individual now cares about what other people are doing too. Um, but another way that we can um, tackle um, individual behavior is thinking about the preferences themselves. So in these two approaches, which is sort of the classic approaches, preferences are thought to be exogenous. We don't question preferences. But it's actually the preferences that are determining the utility function and the payoff function, which people are optimizing over here, right? So um, now, of course, George Akerlof and I are um, leaning on a lot of earlier work, which is trying to think about preferences in people's utility, right? So what are these preferences? So preferences are what a person, say, likes or doesn't like. And so if we go back to Becker, Becker has this beautiful work where he says, OK, let's actually now think about what people are, care about. And then we can get things like theory of the family or you know, a, a model of discrimination. So people may care about who they work with. So they have a preference over who they work with. So people like working with other people and don't like working with I know a different set of people. Okay, so these are preferences in somebody's utility function. And once we introduce some, what you might think of as, um, these aren't preferences over apples and oranges, but these are preferences over, say, who you're working with or having children or something like that, then you can then take these preferences, right, and put them back in the basic economic model uh, or the model with strategic interaction. So we have a richer set of preferences. And that what, what George Akerlof and I are, are doing is trying to expand this notion of preferences from liking and not liking, say, apples and oranges, which could be liking or not liking working with a certain type of person. So liking or not liking to work with women or African Americans or Africans or Roma, right? Okay, so we want to take that likes and not likes, and we want to talk about that as shoulds or shouldn'ts. So these become normative, things that I should or shouldn't do. Okay, so it's not only that I like apples and oranges, I should like apples and oranges. Okay, so you can think about, say, being a vegetarian, right? I should like apples and oranges, and I shouldn't eat meat. Okay, so we want to think about both the likes and the doesn't likes, but also the shoulds or the shouldn'ts. What is it considered to be appropriate and inappropriate behavior? Yes, yeah, so again, we've got, I see all my quotes. <laughs> I should have put quotes around preferences too and quotes around norms. Again, so um, in some sense, everything boils down to preferences, but it's all about how we understand preferences. Do we think of preferences as randomly distributed in the population and exogenous? Or do we think about preferences as learned likes and dislikes? I learn to like certain things and I learn to not like other things and I actually think about things as right and wrong or appropriate and inappropriate. That is not the standard way economists understand preferences, right? However, once I posit them in a certain way and then I can build them into my models, I can then treat them as preferences. But the word preferences typically in economics has not been used that way, okay? Okay, so once we have this richer notion, say, of preferences, we can then put that back into our models. And we can get um, choices and equilibria, which give patterns of behavior. And hold on, one, okay, go ahead. So I'm missing the context. Can you tell me? Capabilities. Mm -hmm. So I'm not sure. I'm not. So I, I don't know this precise work on the articles you may be referring to, so we can talk about that perhaps over break when, you sh when I can actually read it. But if what you describe, it sounds parallel. And in fact, um, Sen does have some work, what he calls about sort of the conflict of the Paratian liberal, which actually refers, you know, we think that the, some of the work that we're doing refers back to that as well. 
right? So what do we do with things that some people like and some people don't like and they think is inappropriate? Again, whose utility do we, do we privilege in that context? Okay. And in particular, whoops. In particular here, I think that once we introduce the, uh, this richer notion of preferences, so what people should or shouldn't do, um, preferences are no longer exogenous, they become endogenous, right? Because if, if preferences are learned, that means there are people who are teaching them. I mean, if people are teaching them, people may be teaching them for a particular reason, right? Okay, so once that, that opens that, it opens up a you know, whole world of understanding um, economic behavior and inequality. Okay, all right, so let's try and put a little bit of language to this. So let's take the example of, again, education. So if we have a utility function and there's an individual with exogenous idiosyncratic preferences and the children that makes choices given the technology and constraints, let's think about this in the context of a child. So the way this model would work is there's a child who likes school or doesn't like school or is more or less talented at schoolwork. And this child weighs the costs and benefits of schooling given, say, cool school quality and the opportunity cost of attending school, job networks, and discrimination. And again, this would lead to particular patterns. So say, African Americans have lower levels of academic achievement because they attend worse schools and have worse job networks. Or another pattern which we would observe is that girls have lower levels of academic achievement because they have a higher opportunity cost of time because later, either today or in the future, they're going to be spending more time at home. Um, I'd say from the, what you've just described, the answer would be not exactly no. I'd say no because the, the, what you've just described is still taking the individual's characteristics or the individual's tastes as exogenous and doesn't give them a societal basis to them. So exactly what we're trying to do here is say that whether an individual likes a particular job or not or whether a firm mm -hmm. likes to have an individual worker or not is going to depend on something that they've perhaps, when I say learned here, it's not that they've learned some information about that worker, but they've learned to like particular kinds of workers or not when they were kids. So they've internalized so certain social norms of whether or not they should like working with um, kids of a particular background. No, I want to start my model before time zero. Okay. See, exactly what we're doing here is we're going back before time zero. Okay. <laughs> right? Yeah. So what makes a good match? Yeah. Right? So I want to go back to the payoff function and the utility function that tells me whether a match will be good or not. Okay? So maybe that will become clearer as we go along. Okay, so here again we're starting with, a, say, a kid with a utility function. This kid is weighing the costs and benefits of schooling, and from that we can um, potentially get these patterns. Now this model is, could be useful because indeed there may be technology and constraints that in fact do affect kids' choices in schools, of whether or not they'll achieve more in schools or not. Right? And so there may indeed um, be, for example, African Americans attend worse schools, so their complementary input to their own effort in school isn't going to be as high, so they're going to exert less effort in school than, say, a kid in a different neighborhood. Okay, so indeed it may be that there are, you know, and we certainly look out there in the world, there are lots of differences in the schools, say, in the United States that African Americans attend and that whites attend. There's a big difference in those schools. Okay, so having this view where we have a child who's making a decision given um, the technology of constraints that leads to particular patterns is a very useful framework because indeed we do want to think about what are the constraints facing children. But it begs the question, so this is going back to, I want to go before time zero. Why do blacks attend worse schools? Why are there worse schools in African American neighborhoods? 
right? You know, why, why is that phenomenon? Why is it that women should attend to household chores? Right? So again, going before time zero. Why is there discrimination? Okay, so I want to go behind these preferences, behind the technology, behind the constraints. So essentially, what this identity economics um, is doing in terms of inequality is pushing this inequality up one level. Right? I want to know what's behind the assumptions in our models. No, see, I want to model that. That's exactly what I want to model. I want to understand, for example, I, I haven't gotten there yet in my, own, you know, in my own models, but that's what I want maybe you guys to model. Is I, want you to, I want you to model the evolution of the law. So it's really interesting if you go and you read the Supreme Court decisions. Right? You, read the, you actually sit down and read the Supreme Court decisions. Right? So Plessy versus Ferguson and so on. And read, read them. I mean, it's really remarkable what the court is actually battling with. They could legislate, for example, or they could follow society in its own thinking about race. So, and what I want to understand is the interaction between that and, you know, and perhaps the economics at, uh, of the times. So we were talking yesterday about um, testing. The whole laws, the whole regulations in the United States, again, I know you guys are coming from many different countries, the regulations in the United States about testing for job applicants has evolved from, in the legal structure, from the Civil Rights Acts. So the Civil Rights Acts are laws, but how did those laws come into play? Okay, so they're not, they're, they're there. You can take them as exogenous, you can look at today, right? Or you can say, well, actually, why those laws and why at that particular time? Sure. Well, let's, let's examine that. And there are economists who are examining that. They're saying, you know, why do we see legal structures emerge in particular ways? What are the interest groups that lead to particular legal structures? So, you know, that's open. You know, we, we, can, we can look at that. And in fact, there are people who are, in, in, who are doing theories of economic development that want to understand, for example, when indeed a legal structure starts to take precedence over more kinds of social networks or crony, you know, sort of crony, uh, crony capitalism, so to speak. And that is a very important part of the process of development is, and then you have to think about who, in whose interest is it? So um, I don't know if Raquel Fernandez talked about the franchise. Why did women get the right to vote when they did? Right? There are lots of interesting discussions about that. There's, a huge, there's actually now great economics literature on that as well. There was a hand back there somewhere. Okay. If our preferences are depend on a certain context or can be learned, does it mean that you are socially determined or not? So get right. So this is um, again. I don't have an answer for that, and I think what you've just put your finger on is a big debate is, is sort of the difference between economics and sociology and their approaches. So a sociologist would say, you know, you're formed within a society, you then just make these choices almost automatically, you don't have agency, right? Agency in the sense of being able to make your own decisions. And an economist would say, no, you always have free choice. You can always do whatever you want to do. So what we're kind of posing here is a little bit of a middle of the middle of that, is saying that your preferences which then shape your decisions, may be things that you have learned. But you still have choice given preferences, right? And then we can actually think about, do you actually get to choose your preferences, right? And so we can, ha can th talk about that as well. All right. OK, so again, what I want to push here is the idea is that we actually want to think about, was it, sorry. About sociology, sure.
So I'm, I'm going to completely agree with you. And so if everyone heard what Stephen said, that would expand and perhaps clarify my answer. So I think what we're trying to do is, in, in some sense, bring in the social context to economics. But I don't want to abandon the idea that an individual has choice. So the extreme version of sociology would say that an individual has no choice. Right? They're sort of automatons. And I'm not sure, I'm probably caricaturing the sociology. Very good. <laughs> OK, great. Yeah, so what's great about Wisconsin is that um, it's very eclectic in some sense as well. So you're absolutely. So I'm caricaturing a particular school of sociology. OK, so I think we're, we're all good here. All right. OK, so now I want to go again and give um, the same sort of story about education, but I want to think about a model where individuals care about other people's actions. So, um, no, let me see. All right, so let's just jump to this. So, um, so now let's think about girls and girls investing less in school, right? But they might not be doing it because they are concerned about spending time in school, you know, spending time in school versus home themselves. They're actually concerned about whether or not they can get married. Okay, so now we're actually worried about how the marriage market works. So we've now added the interaction between people to our model of, say, a kid's decision about how much to invest in school. And so I'm going to present a model to you later that, say, African Americans don't achieve in school because it actually reveals that they are dedicated to providing public goods to their community. So again, we're worried about what other people think and what other people will do. And we're worried about the social interaction, uh, say, in a particular community. And so it might be that blacks are less interested in, say, investing in schooling because it means that they will have less interactions within their own community. Yeah. So far, I haven't changed preferences. So going back, yeah. the basic economic model, I haven't changed preferences. I've just taken the preferences given, but then I've said, but wait, why should I take prep? So I'm, I haven't yet addressed why, um, why blacks attend worse schools. I'm saying that if you build an economic model and you, you have in it that blacks attend worse schools and you can get your pattern of inequality, I would say, hmm, that's interesting, but why do blacks attend worse schools? Okay, so that's, and I haven't done that yet in my slides. I'm just saying that's a question we should be asking. OK, um, all right, actually, let me say this. So now, um, so now we've, we've, we can add to our models the fact that inequality is the outcome of strategic interaction. So we can build models where, um, for example, an African American will get lower um, education than um, a white, you know, a white um, American. And we can build a model of that. And we can get that through, actually, Let's see. We can get that through an equilibrium phenomenon, right? So that, uh, or girls don't get as much education because they're concerned about their marriage prospects. So we can get that through an equilibrium of a strategic game. And typically, these models might have multiple equilibria. So you have these bad equilibria and have these good equilibria, right? And if you have these bad equilibria and these good equilibria, it may be that you need intervention to change the equilibrium. So we can look back and see the United States' civil rights law. And you'd say, you know, actually, that was addressing what might have been looked like a bad equilibrium, right? So nobody hired African Americans because people were concerned about how their customers would feel about being served by African Americans. But business was actually, they were, it was, you know, and, 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 and so you can build a model where nobody hires African Americans because customers don't want to be served by African Americans, and these businesses will be concerned about losing money. And then it just, you can build an equilibrium where that works. And then somebody, but there's also an equilibrium where everyone gets served by whomever, and everyone is fine with it. So you can build these two equilibria, and maybe if you have a, a situation with multiple equilibria, what you need is an intervention to get us out of one equilibrium. And so that's one interpretation of civil rights law. So one interpretation of, of social norms is that social norms are sort of bad equilibria of a strategic game. But I want to bring two basic points. The theoretical requirements to sustain the equilibria in these models are usually very strong. So how can you sustain the idea that, say, African Americans shouldn't be hired to 
work in particular jobs, right? You can sustain that by if you don't, if you hire African Americans, then you'll be punished by your customers not buying from you. But then why wouldn't the customers actually be interested in buying from you at a lower price? Because after all, you could hire these African Americans at a lower wage. So why wouldn't customers be interested in coming to, you, to your store and buying from your store at a lower price? Well, because they might be concerned about being punished socially by their neighbors. And why do their neighbors actually punish the people who buy from a store who, buy, who, has, who has African Americans serving them? Because they themselves will be punished. So these equilibria are sustained through a lot of punishment or beliefs that have to be self-sustaining. And if you look at these models, the theoretical requirements are actually extraordinarily strong to sustain these sort of bad equilibria. Um, that's one point, is that you actually, if you look at the models themselves and you actually say, do I believe it? It requires a lot of um, extremely strong assumptions about forward-looking behavior um, about individuals. They understand how they'll be punished, they understand the treatment in the labor market, they understand the treatment and the, how they'll be treated in the, in the marriage market and so on. That's one point. Another point is to say, okay, let's look about the discussions about norms that people have out there about, say, for example, for African Americans, whether it's appropriate or inappropriate to be achieving well in school. And um, there's actually a lot of discussions in the literature and the press among law and activists about inappropriate and appropriate behavior. So should we as economists simply ignore all of the discussions out there among, in, you know, among social activists about changing social norms, about what it means to be a woman, what it means to be a black, what it means to be Hispanic, what it means to be French, what it means, right? So you know, should we be just ignoring that whole discussion? Is it meaningless for us when we build our models? Or maybe actually these changes in norms about appro appropriate and inappropriate for behavior, say for women or African Americans or North Africans or whatever context you want to pick, right? Maybe those discussions in the press, among activists, um, different sides of these debates actually does affect the way people make their choices ultimately and as, as these things change over time, okay? So again, you can all probably pick a favorite context where you see these debates going on. And should we just say, ah, oh, that's just talk? But actually, not, you know, it's not talk. It actually makes its way into the law eventually. Right? And it does affect the legal structure in which people are making decisions. And so I put these two examples up here. They're kind of fun examples. Again, it's from the American context. So in the American context, there's a lot of discussion about appropriate and inappropriate behavior for African Americans as to what it means to actually act real. So that's actually in a quote. You know, you gotta act real as an African American. Okay, well, what does that mean? Okay, and if you're acting real, are you somehow not acting black, right? And there's a lot of discussion, again, in, you know, in the United States about what it means to be African American and what is appropriate and inappropriate behavior. And this is a really fun example coming from Duke. Um, this is really recent, so you might think this is all in the past. You know, okay, Obama's president, nobody's talking about this anymore. No, it's still going on, okay, it's still going on. Grant Hill, as you know, is a basketball, maybe you don't know, I didn't know. Grant Hill is a basketball player, he graduated from Duke. Duke has a great basketball program, collegiate basketball program. And what's interesting being at Duke is that everybody accuses Duke's basketball program as having black players who aren't really black. That's what they say. Right? And you know, this is in the sports press. And, you know, and there's, there's this rivalry between the Duke basketball players and a Michigan team you know, in, the seven, or in the 90s, right? And at some point, this Michigan team comes out with this. There's a, the Fab Five. They come out with a documentary. Of the, there's a documentary on the Fab Five. And in some sense, it's talking, you know, sort of doing some trash talk, I guess, with the Duke basketball team. And so Grant Hill then feels Import, it feels it's important to write an editorial to the New York Times about what are you guys talking about? You know, I went to Duke, I'm black. I, my mother worked, my father worked. I came from a two-parent household. That's black too. Sorry? His father went to Yale? <laughs> okay, so there we go. So, 
Um, so, the, so the point is, is these discussions are still going on, okay, about what, what you know, having a two-parent household where both parents are working, have good jobs, and are highly educated is also black, okay? So I'm just pointing these out as saying, you know, we as economists aren't typically, we don't typically look at this evidence, we don't typically look at this, but I think we should. And we should start to think about how, how to look at these things systematically. And I'm going to give some examples of some work that is actually trying to look at, look at some of these discussions and um, societal um, movements more systematically. Okay. All right. Um, I'm going to skip this. I think I've already said this. So um, actually, the models I have are that blacks actually invest in their public community, not the other way around. So I hope that that wasn't misunderstood. That's the first point. Is actually, there's a, the idea is that you don't get in it. I'll, I'm going to show you the model. Okay, that's the first point. But the second point, which I think is a richer, richer point, not the sort of details of a model, is you know how how is the social change affected? How does it actually happen? So how do we get social movements? Right. If it indeed is this is the predominant notion of, say, what it means to be African American or what it means to be a woman, how do we then eventually get the civil rights law? And I frankly do not have an answer to that. Again, I'm going to throw this out as questions for you guys. What we've done thus far is sort of pose the framework, and I'm going to give you a sense of our framework. And sort of where do these norms come from, how do they evolve, how are they changed, is indeed topics for further research. Okay. Um, and in, in some sense, I have to marvel at your ambition. Mm -hmm. it, it strikes me that you're reinventing the, the entire intellectual endeavor that is sociology, um, which is to look at individual decisions within the constraints that they face, be they mm -hmm. imposed by, by, by cost or by more abstract notions of social norms. Um, so you touched on so many different literatures and subfields that have sociology <laughs> has dealt with for decades yep. and decades. Yep. And in, in some ways, um, I, I think um, it would be easier for, for me personally to, to figure out where you're going if, if we're more precise about uh, what it is we're trying to explain. Because mm -hmm. so in sociology, for example, we have a large literature about group formation. Mm -hmm. What is it that explains that groups become uh, a saving identity? Right. Because if you're saying, well, uh, blacks have a certain identity, well, how, how is it that black actually comes feel that way in the first place? Right? Or if you're mm -hmm. saying, well, uh, norms come from, come from somewhere, um, that, that also has a very long yep. sure. tradition. And sure. how that relates to inequality is like a whole other issue. Absolutely, yeah. It's quite hard. <laughs> okay, so I have a book on this, and well, George and I have a book on this. So we're completely, again, going back to Stephen's point, uh, we're completely aware of all the sociology literature. <laughs> and in fact, what we view, and the social psychology literature and the psychology literature, and what we view ourselves doing as bringing these very basic notions of social context, identity, and group into economic models. That's what we're doing. So in some sense, what we're doing is a bit of an exercise in translation. Okay, and so we're bringing these really sort of bread and what, what so we think bread and butter in the, in, in economics is supply and demand. Okay, and so in sociology it might be identity, group, social context. So we want to make those, we want to bring those into our models. Okay, and then to be really, really ambitious is that we want to think about how supply and demand affect those concepts like identity, groups, and so on. 
Okay, and so that is the meta agenda here. And again, we've, what we're doing at this point is sort of introducing this into economics and sort of this, my last slide is going to be about, in some sense, how economics then feeds back into these contexts. Okay, I hope that's helpful. And given this, as I'm going to, um, I think I've sort of covered all this. Okay, I think I've already covered it. Okay, so what I think, what I think could be useful here is, um, is actually get a little bit into specific models. Yeah, sure. So again, this is an issue of language, um, and we struggled a lot with this. So in our original notion, when we wrote down our models, we had, um, so if you look back at our 2000 paper, we used the word prescriptions rather than norms. And the idea of this is prescribed behavior, right? Uh, and we use that because norms, who asked me the question about vocabulary, right? Norms had been hijacked. It had been hijacked in economics to mean other things. And so we felt that using norms would be hard to sell. Then we had this word prescriptions, meaning prescribed behavior. And um, then we realized nobody quite understood that. So we went back to using norms. But then we're now in this problem. So should, is, should can come from a variety of you know, motives, right? So I should because I think it's the right thing to do. I should because if I don't, um, I'll feel really weird myself. Or I should because other people will think I'm a geek if I don't. You know, so there's, and the geek bit is because that's socially defined, right? So should can, re, re, you know, refer to many different things. And in indeed, in the models, that's where we try and distinguish them. When we actually write down a model, we try and distinguish between these possible different motives. So maybe it's time actually to show a little bit of the modeling. Um, I'm going to go, I wonder how I should do this. How, how ambitious should I be about d diverging from my slides? And it's usually a bad idea. So I, I think I'll stick to what I've got here. So while we're going to get to these identity models, I promise, what I want to do is present a non-identity model first, okay, to give a sense of the contrast. So what I'm going to do here is um, give a specific model. All of the models that I'm going to present are going to be about workers' participation in the labor force or workers' participation uh, or a, a child's choice about education, right? That's what we're going to be. That's the context. And the first model I'm going to present is... Um, the Austin, Fryer, Austin Smith and Fryer model. And it's, you know, I've got these three categories of economic theory. One is just individual choice. The other is individual choice when you're worried about other people's actions. And the third is the identity model. So I've got these three. So the individual choice one was nicely covered by Chris yesterday. So I'm not actually going to deal with those as much. So, you know, people have tastes, they make choices, and that's it. Okay. So I'm going to give you um, a model where um, workers are making this investment in education and participation in the labor force, and they're going to be concerned about other people's actions as well. Okay? And then I'm going to give you some identity models. Okay, because history tells us that the role that women have played in the household has changed. And if preferences are constant over time, we shouldn't have seen that. So, you know, there's always this um, problem in economics. Let me go back to this. Okay, where, where's this slide? I mean, maybe I should keep this slide up there for a while. And it's really a good slide to have up in Chicago. Um, you know, and, and, you know, and here's, here's one reason why is that, okay, I can explain anything I want with a basic economic model. If I'm really good, any economist who's really good can explain anything they want with a basic economic model. 
You can. We can do it. That's what we're trained to do. Right? We can all do it. The question is, is do we believe our model? Do we believe that it's telling us about what's actually going on? Okay? And I'd say there's two criteria, and I, I'm not going to get back to Friedman. Friedman has this a particular criteria which says if the predictions are right, it's a good model. One could say that. You know, I can build a model that is on preferences, technology, and constraints, and I can get a really good predictive model. I can, you know, I can, my model will predict patterns. Wonderful. Maybe that's all I want. Okay? So we're really, I told you I was going to go on, off on limbs here. Here's another, here's a limb, all right? We could take the Friedman prescription, uh, prescription, ah, there's a nice word, about how we as economists should be, you know, should be doing our models, which is you build a model, you get the predictions. If the model matches the predictions, I'm good. Okay? One problem I personally think with that is that while we here in the academy sort of know that the model's a fiction and it's just there to generate predictions, people out there don't know that. They actually think we believe our model. They actually think we believe the mechanisms. That's one thing. Okay? And I think there's an issue about or the rhetoric of research that we should be careful. Okay, so yeah, I can build the model, but am I really capturing what's going on? And so there I would ask some other criteria. Well, well actually, let's take a look at this model. Do I really think that, you know, I can build a model where people are forward-looking, rational, and so on, and I can generate these patterns, but do I actually think that the theoretical requirements to sustain the equilibria are indeed met by individual actors, right? And if the answer to that is no, well, maybe I might want to question my model. And here's the other point. Should we ignore everything that is out there about norms and prescriptions and preferences, right? Should we just ignore all of that and say it has nothing to do with how people are making decisions? And I would say the answer to that is no. Yeah. Right. Maybe the, the models by themselves are overly simplistic and have these strong theoretical requirements, but if you build in enough complexity, the theoretical requirements are sort of less. <coughs> so the, the requirements to sustain the equilibrium are kind of less strong. Like, if you only have customer discrimination, there are strong requirements. But if you have customer discrimination and discrimination by employers and discrimination yeah. by multiple places. Right. So again, I'd say that. Um, Sure. I, again, I'm going to go back to the same answer. I can do that. I can build a complex model. I can do it. Yeah. Do I believe it? You know, and so you know, I told you I'm, this is a, one of my limbs I'm going out on. So yeah, I, I, you know, so again, um, I build all sorts of models <laughs> with ridiculous assumptions about rationality in them. And I, you know, I have another hat where I do this, right? And I don't want to say that these models are useless. I, in fact, in my slides, I keep saying, this is useful because, this is useful because, right? So for example, in this model that you just described, usually the way we, we have these norms, usually these norms, that if you look out there in these models, you can build these models where you have good norms, and good equilibria, and bad equilibria, right? So you usually have multiple equilibria in these models, right? So in the statistical discrimination model, you have a model where there is statistical, sorry, you have an equilibrium where there is statistical discrimination, and you have an equilibrium where there's not. So the question is, how do you move from one equilibrium to the other? That's where you get into the intervention arguments. And so I don't want to dismiss, I actually, I don't want to dismiss that these theoretical models that are, say, um, so a theory which, which gives a prediction about a norm based on some punishment strategies are useless. No, not at all. I think they're extremely useful and extremely useful for very, you know, for very specific environments. I can give you a list, right? I think the United States South is a fantastic list. Is fa sorry, a fantastic example I would put on my list. Another thing would be um, female genital mutilation in Africa. I think that's another that could be put on the list, right? 
So there's many things where I think these models are extraordinarily useful. So I don't mean to at all to dismiss, I'm not here to, dis, you know, to dismiss the previous economics. I'm here to add to it. Okay? And here's one reason why. Why I think we should be aware of, uh, you know, we should be adding to it. One, if there are these theoretical requirements, okay, and you can tell me we can make our models more complex, but the answer is do I believe it? Okay? And then the other one is, you know, we live in this world where there are these debates, vociferous debates going on, where people are losing their lives over these issues. Okay, should we ignore that? And so my answer is no, we shouldn't be. We should be taking this seriously. Right? There are people that marched, there are people that were killed over these issues. Okay? And so this is affecting gender norms, it's affecting norms about race, it's affecting all of, you know, it, it ultimately affects law. Right? But we have to, you know, we have to, I do think we have to engage this. Okay. Um, okay. Where are we? I, my, I've lost my screen. touch the screen. Oh, thank you. I need a real. Okay. All right. So um, I've got a half an hour before our break. Um, so I've, I think I'm, I'm doing a good job on being provocative here, given what you guys are, um, the pushback I'm getting from you guys. So that's good. But uh, what, what, well, what we'll do now is I'm going to actually show you the model. I'm going to show you some models. And this will, I think, answer some questions about, you know, what are we actually trying to do here? How do we operationalize this? The first thing I'm going to do is give you a model that is, um, uh, oh, wow. Oh, yeah. Oh, that's right. I went back to that other screen, so I've got to go way over here. Okay. Okay. So we're going to do some contrast between two, two types of models, Okay. And um, these models um, all deal with what you might think of as worker investment in education or participation in the labor force. Um, so the first model that I'm going to go through is where inequality emerges as an equilibrium phenomenon. So I'm going to look at a strategic game between workers, firms, and a peer group. Right? So I actually have individuals who are making decisions in a strategic context. And we're going to see how inequality might emerge from that. This is the Austin Smith and Fryer model. And then I'm going to be um, talking about some models where inequality emerges from preferences and interactions. So what I want to do is go back, what the sort of lingo we've been using is before time zero. And with, I'm going to sort of build a little model of people's preferences, right? And then bring that into a model of social interaction. And I'm going to give you two um, examples. One is sort of our minority, one we can call our uh, minority po poverty model, and the other is uh, our education and schooling model. And uh, as I go through these, I think it will become clearer about how we operationalize all of those little words that were in quotes on my previous slides, including I probably should have put quotes around preferences, right? Yes? I'll tell you. Yeah, exactly. So they should behave as a black. Right, right. That's exactly, that's, um, I'm going to build their model and I'll tell you exactly why it's not, ex uh, it's not an identity model per se. So the model that you just described and the model that I'm going to you know, describe for you here, slightly different. So this is a little bit different. The model, you, what you described is sort of the, what they relate to their empirical work. Yeah, it's fine. It's the same set of work. So it's, again, we can build this model where you have this repeated interaction or you have response of a peer group and so on, right? But there's nothing in that model which says it has to be African Americans. I could do the same thing and I could build it for another set of people. Okay? And so that's the fundamental difference. So basically the way, uh, the way you can understand this, if you look at all of these models about social norms as equilibrium phenomenon, so inequality as an equilibrium phenomenon or some social norm as an equilibrium phenomenon, is you build a model 
you find an equilibrium, and then you label it blacks. As opposed to starting from looking at the payoff functions, looking at the social context. Okay? So I hope that will become clear as I go through. Again, it's not to say that these models aren't valuable. Yeah. Right. Okay, so good. I think that we're at the right point to get into some modeling. Okay. So what I'm going to do is go through the Austin Smith and Fryer acting white model, and then I'm going to go through um, some of the models that George Akerlof and I have written down. So what I want to do here is build a model of African-American underachievement in school. And we're going to see this social norm, right, the idea that uh, people shouldn't, um, African-Americans shouldn't get a higher education. So shouldn't here use in a different way than I use shouldn't for my identity models, right? as the outcome of the signaling game. So we're going to see the sort of this, uh, so, the, so I, I mentioned before, I'm sort of jumping around here, but so in answer to something Stephen asked, he asked, you know, what does should mean? So again, when we first wrote down our notion of should, we used the word prescription because the word norm had been used for other purposes within economics. Okay, it had been used to describe the equilibrium of a game. Okay, so social norms in economics are used that word, social norms, is used to apply to many different outcomes of, of different theoretical models. One is the outcome of repeated action in a game, right? So you have an equilibrium. And the other is the type of things that George and I have been talking about. So again, we're going to have to get back into the models to see exactly what these words mean. OK, so this is going to be a signaling game. You guys are probably all familiar with signaling games. That's one reason why I picked this one to, um, to show you. So people are going to choose an action to signal some underlying desirable attribute. Okay, that's what signaling games are all about. There's some unobservable characteristics, and people are going to choose actions. And the idea, there's an audience out there that wants to uncover this attribute. And they're going to look at this signal, and they're trying to try and infer something about this, undesir about this desirable attribute. So what we're going to he here see in this model is that pe people are going to signal their sociability, another quote for you, quotes, in quotes, they signal their sociability by not achieving in school. Okay, so that's exactly what we're going to see here. And then once we build this model, we're going to interpret, or at least Austin Fry Smith and Fryer interpret this um, not achieving in school as the phenomenon of a particular social group. And we're going to just now look, we're just now going to label these kids African Americans, but there's nothing in the model per se Right, that makes us a model about African Americans. Okay? Yeah. All right. Okay, so let's go to a, bit, a bit get into the guts of the model. So you start out with three sets of agents. You have individuals, firms, and peer groups. Okay. Individuals have two hidden characteristics. So now we start to get on solid ground, actually, because I'm building a model, right? <laughs> individuals have two hidden characteristics. They have a social type. Um, which is either low or high, and they have an economic type. Okay. okay, so people have these two possibly hidden characteristics. We're going to say that the distribution of characteristics are known. So there's a social types, and there's a probability that any individual within the population has a high social type. And there is a distribution function for the economic types. Okay, so st really standard stuff. So each individual, these are IID, so each individual, no, sorry, not, sorry, they're not I. They're just <laughs> independently distributed. They're not identically distributed. Sorry about that. But this lambda and phi are, are drawn from these two different distributions independently. And, okay, so each individual has a type. They're a high or low sociability type, and then they have this economic type, right? Okay, so I can be a really you know, gregarious person and be really high-skilled or, lo or low-skilled or have low ability. Let's call it ability. Um, individuals have a unit of time, and they decide how much education to obtain in that unit of time. Okay, so we have a choice. Uh, are we all sort of on solid ground now? Yeah? All right. Okay, so the cost of education um, depends on the economic type. So there's a cost of education, which depends on the, well, the unit number of schooling units I obtain and phi. And we make the um, typical assumptions that you would make in, in a Spence model that if you're a higher economic type, there's a lower cost uh, for, getting, for getting any particular unit of education, right? And we assume a single crossing property and so on. So this is exactly the Spence model um, in terms of 
education and economic ability. So this economic type. Okay. All right. Great. Uh, the marginal product of a worker is increasing in both schooling and their um, ability. And you can assume a complementarity between schooling and ability. Okay, and you can assume a particular functional form. All right, great. All right, so what about firms? Uh, firms are competitive, so they pay the expected marginal product. Okay, they're going to pay the expected marginal product of a worker. And the, the basic model, sorry, not the basic model, but the, the model that gives us all the results is where the firm can observe schooling but not ability. Again, exactly as an expense model. So you can observe the, the, the individual's underlying ability, but you can observe, but you can observe how much schooling they've gotten. Right? So it's exactly a signaling model in that sense. Okay, so again I said that. Okay, so so far we have a expense signaling model. Now what we're going to do is we're going to add a second audience, right? And a second motivation for the individual. We're going to add a peer group. So um, the individual is interested in being accepted by the peer group, okay? And we're going to see, and the way, the way that's specified is because the individual is um, interested in leisure time, and if they're accepted in the peer group, they get more, have more fun, okay? And the peer group is interested in the sociability of the individual. So the peer group wants to accept an individual who's highly sociable, okay? So you, one could do this as sort of public goods, but in the model it's not. It's actually just sociability, okay? Is everybody with me? So now I have two characteristics for the individual, sociability and economic type, and I have two audiences, firms and um, peer groups. Okay? Okay, so the peer group is only interested in accepting high sociability people. So you can put down the, um, the utility um, that, that goes with, you can make the assumptions on the utility that makes that true. And then here's some notation that might come up later in the slides. Um, the, the peer group either accepts or not an individual. Okay. okay, so an individual has utility from leisure time, like I said earlier. And this utility from leisure time is higher for the sociability type when the sociability type is accepted in the peer group. So 1 minus s is the amount of leisure time. Remember, s is education. So 1 minus s is leisure, right? And your value, an individual's value of leisure time depends on acceptance in the peer group and their sociability. Okay? Great. So you can write down an individual utility function. So individual utility depends on the wage that they earned, their leisure time, and the cost of education. Okay? So that's an individual's utility. So an individual is going to be um, determining S, right? It's going to be choosing S trying to understand what is going to be the acceptance of the peer group and the wage they're going to earn. Oh, yeah. So that was my timeline. Here's my timeline. I'm going to put it down here. So it's really important in the signaling games to have a timeline. And that's fine. I think you can all see this. Can you all see this? So individuals know type. So they all know their own type. So they know their lambda and their phi, right? So each, in, and every, each individual knows their own type. Then what happens is the individual, individuals choose S. That's what they get to choose, OK? And then the firm. makes wage offers, right? And we're going to be thinking about those wage offers as contingent on S. Because again, in the, in, the, in, the, in the version of the model that's going to give us all, re, all, of the, all of our results is the firm can only see S. It can't see anything else. Okay? And the peer group, whoops, accepts or not, Again, observing only S, right? And then we have payoffs. Okay. So what we have here is, a, again, a standard signaling game. 
And what we're adding here is the peer group. The peer group and the sociability. All right? To accept or not an individual. Yeah. So that's here. Again, so this again, this is the timing of the moves. The individual knows their own type. The individual chooses S. The firm makes wage offers. And the peer group accepts or not the individual. Okay, has everybody got the timeline? Yeah. Yeah, it's just assumed to be there's a, there's a single decision. It's as if, it, as if there, there isn't a decision-making process within the peer group. So it can be one friend. It doesn't have to be a group. It could be a single friend. Any other questions about the setup of the model? Yep. Yeah, there's one. You can think about this. You, you, again, so this is the, the, you know, what we do with models. I write down the math, and then I call this a peer group. Okay? It, it could be an individual, right? It could be just an individual friend. In other words, I can care about just the what other, one other friend. And it comes from my utility function. Uh, Right? Acceptance or not by this entity, right, is going to affect the individual's utility. Absolutely. Right. Right. Here, there is no coordination among the peer group. I mean, one could embellish this and have a coordination game. One could do that. Okay. Again, it's still a game. Okay. I mean, well, okay. I, I didn't mean to say it like that. I, I love games. What I meant to say is that what we want to do is question this. We want to know what's going on behind here. I want to know what this is about. No, yeah, this happens to say, yeah, it doesn't matter. This can be done simultaneously. Whoops, this can be done simultaneously. And in fact, it is in the model. Right, so it's, this is going on at the same time. Okay. All right. Uh, okay, so we're going to look for a sequential equilibrium where agents are acting optimally given their types and the actions of other agents, and beliefs are consistent with equilibrium actions. So the agents. Every, so the um, individuals here are, are in some sense forward-looking, right? They're going to anticipate the firm's wage offers, and they're going to anticipate the acceptance or not of the peer group. And the firm, when making its wage offers, and the peer group making its accept or not decision, are going to have beliefs over types, right, that are going to have to be in, in equilibrium, consistent with the action that the individuals are taking. Okay? So we're going to look for a sequential equilibrium. Okay, so now let's just run through the model. So let's start with a complete information benchmark. So we've got firms, and uh, we've got the peer group. And let's just suppose the firms, both the firms and the peer group, can observe both the sociability and the um, ability, the economic type. So firms are going to pay their marginal product. Uh, the peer group accepts high sociability types and rejects low sociability types. And individuals are choosing S to maximize utility. So you can see I'm kind of working backwards, right? Because I want to understand, you know, how the firm's wage offers and the peer group acceptance or not is going to affect individuals' choices. And then, of course, that's going to have to feed back into having these beliefs be consistent with what they do, right? So you're with me? Everybody with me here? Okay. All right. So, you know, again, if the firms and the peer group uh, can observe lambda and phi, we have no issue, right? Uh, this high sociability types are going to choose a lower um, S because they have higher returns to leisure. You know, these guys like hanging, around, hanging out with friends. Okay, well, that's fine. Oh, so we can write this all down in terms of the utility. All right. Okay. So what I want to do here is just introduce this idea of an S star. And this S star is the optimal choice of S for a given type um, T from the 
complete information benchmark. And so we will sort of always what we do in these models is we say, okay, so suppose information is freely accessible to everyone, what would you know, sort of the complete information benchmark look like? And then we look at an information asymmetry and see how that leads to some sort of distortion. So we're going to look for distortions away from S star, right? So in this model, high sociability types, right, do get less education because they enjoy leisure more. That's fine. They've made their choice. That's fine. They like leisure more, and that's what they do. There's no quote unquote problem with that. It's efficient. So what we're going to look for is an in, in, in inefficiency caused by an information asymmetry. Okay. Um, I can't see the clock. There we go. Okay. <laughs> Thank you. All right. Okay. So great. So now we're going to consider two partial um, information um, scenarios. Uh, we're first going to think about the social type being observable, but the economic type not being observable. Then the economic type being observable, but the social type being not observable. Okay, so we're going to think about two partial equilibrium, uh, sorry, partial e information scenarios. Um, and these are going to be essentially single audience signaling problems. Okay, so we're going to get the similar types of results we would get from the Spence model. Then we're going to consider a two-audience signaling problem where both the social and the economic types are not observable. And this is where we're going to get the main message of the paper. Okay? Everybody with me? Okay. So if we run through the social type being observable but the economic type not being observable, what do we have? Well, you know, the peer group, all they care about is sociability. That's all they care about. So the peer group accepts only high sociability types. That comes from the peer group's utility, or peer group's payoffs. And the individuals are going to use S to signal economic types to firms. Okay? So the utility from S is going to depend on whether a person, an individual, is a high or low sociability type. And for all levels of uh, economic ability, H workers undertake lower S. So this is just what we had in the complete information setting, right? If you're a high sociability worker, sorry, yeah, high sociability worker, you're still you're going to want to take lower S because you have a higher return from leisure, right? And you actually don't get an inefficiency in this model because the employers can observe lambda, so the employers can actually infer the economic type directly from S. So what you get is the high workers and the low workers in terms of sociability actually separate and they um, adopt different S's and the work and then uh, the S's that are now really just a function of phi because this is observable and so you essentially get an efficient outcome. So if you have a single audience problem but you have these two unobservable types, sorry, said that wrong. This is like fatigue setting in 10 minutes before our break. If you have one type observable but not the other type observable, so you have a single audience problem, you're going to get an efficient outcome, okay? Because essentially, the, because the firm can observe the other type. Okay. Okay. Now let's get to the economic type being observable but the social type not observable, okay? So this is really easy. Um, the firms play according to S and phi, and again, you're going to get a separating equilibrium. The low sociability types are going to undertake the optimal level of education given that they're not accepted in the peer group. And the high sociability individuals are going to take the optimal education given that they would be accepted into the peer group. Okay? And the peer group, seeing S, knows that S is a perfect, um, is perfectly related to lambda. And the peer group re rejects individuals undertaking the low education and accepts, no, flip that around. The peer group rejects individuals taking, undertaking the high education level and accepts individuals undertaking the low education level. Okay? Right? Everyone see how that can work? And again, these are the optimal levels from the um, complete information case. So again, we don't have any distortion. Am I, is everybody with me or are you all sort of losing me five minutes before the break? Yeah, that's, yeah. Right, so what's, what's, 
fundamental in this model, what's fundamental in this model is there's only one thing that workers can use to signal both characteristics. So that's key to the model. So a worker cannot, cannot signal their sociability by some other means. The only thing they have to signal their underlying types, their two characteristics, is education. Okay, so again, that's fundamental to the model. Again, and it's, I think it's really critical to understand that. So I'm glad you raised that point. There's two types, sorry, there's two characteristics, but only one thing that can be used to signal those characteristics. Okay. All right. Now we get to the um, sort of the, the scenario that gives the, the main results of the paper. Let's suppose that both the economic type and the social type are not observable. The firm is going to pay according to S, and they're going to infer the economic type from S. And the peer group is going to accept or reject according to lambda, which is also inferred from S. And so here, okay, so you um, predicted what was going to come on this slide. The only way to signal sociability is through S. So in all equilibria, worker strategies have the following form. Okay, so low sociability individuals are going to separate by phi. Okay, so the low individual, the, the very low um, ability individuals are going to, the, the, the guys at the bottom of the low sociability are going to adopt this sort of, the one they would do if they're not going to be accepted in the peer group, right? And the higher ones are going to actually get a higher level of S. The higher phi people are going to get a higher level of S. All of the guts of the model of the results are coming from these high sociability people. The high sociability people, and it's actually these people here that we're really worried about. Okay. We're worried about the high sociability people, right? And these high sociability people are going to separate. Um, especially those at the bottom of the economic ability scale. Okay, they want to separate because essentially the high sociability people have to signal that they're high sociability to the peer group. And the only way they can do that is by suppressing the level of S. Okay, so that's the intuition that's going on here. Right? And these guys, they have such a utility from being accepted to the peer group that they're willing to trade off acceptance in the peer group from the wages. You know, so they're willing to give up on the wages from the higher education because they want this acceptability in the peer group. And the, and, but in order to separate, right, in order to just really signal that they have high sociability, they have to suppress their S. Okay, and that's what's behind this notation. <laughs> okay. And as you move up the economic ability scale for these high sociability individuals, they're no longer willing to give up the wages. Right? Are you with me? So that's what's sort of behind all of this um, notation. And you're going to now, now you actually have an inefficiency. And the inefficiency is coming from the high sociability, low um, economic ability types. So again, what they're, they're, they don't actually have these high sociability types. Um, because, they would have to, because they would have to adopt a very high level of S, Right, in order to imitate the high economic ability types. They're not willing to do it because, again, they enjoy leisure because of their high lambda. So what you have here are high sociability types right, separating from low <coughs> sociability types right, in order to signal that they're high sociability types through, ec through education. Because, again, it's the only thing they have to signal that they're high, um, they're high sociability types. So do you guys get the intuition? Is everybody set? Yeah, I'm seeing lots of nods. Is there somebody, are we, are we good? Okay, great. So again, the intuition, I'm going to sort of try to hammer it home. What we have here is we have an individual that has two um, characteristics, sociability and ec uh, sort of a, so a social type and an economic type. And the only way that they can signal their, either of these two characteristics is through their education. And there's a two audiences, the firms and the peer groups. And so the high sociability types who get a lot of leisure from hanging out with their peer group 
will suppress their level of education, right, in order to separate from the low sociability types, just, you know, to make a discre just sort of discrete way of understanding this, so that they will be accepted into the peer group. And again, the peer group is fully rational here. They understand what S, you know, they understand the S strategies of the different types, and so they're only going to accept individuals who get low levels of education into their peer group, right? Okay. Yes. Yeah, so it's an assumption of the model. So a way back when, in a previous slide, I put down the payoffs of the peer group. So again, what we have here, so going back to my beginning of, you know, when we started at 9 o'clock, around 9.20, I had up this slide here with three types of economic models. The basic one, then we've got, this is a strategic interaction model, and I've specified the payoffs of the individual, the payoffs of the firms, the payoffs of the peer group, and I have a game, right? And I look at the equilibrium of the game, okay? And so here I've got the equilibrium of the game, and this equilibrium of the game involves inefficiencies. Um, it's inefficient in the sense that we actually have workers, um, it, so we've got this, okay, I just, we have workers under providing or under investing in education is what we actually have here, right? Sorry, I, I didn't catch it. If I assume what? Yeah, so, you know, you can embellish this in lots of different ways. And um, so, but since we're getting towards 1030, what I just want to say is that um, maybe I, you can make the peer group more complicated, right? And I think that you could introduce some complementarities, but you have to be careful which you introduce and maintain the results. Okay, so for example, if you think that the peer group cares about how much money their friends make, because then it's more fun to go out with a friend who can actually buy everybody beer, then you might not have this relationship. So you have to think, so again, it's all coming from these payoff functions, right? It's all how you specify the payoffs and the utility as related to, t, what is it, uh, the type, L lambda and phi, and S for the firm. The firm cares about S, but maybe the peer group might care about S too, because S then tells you about wages, and wages then increases peer group utility. But that's not here. So the question is, is what can you add that keeps the result, this inefficient result, and what can you add that doesn't? Probably not, but I'd have to work it through. So, sorry, we'll talk about this over coffee, but I, I, want, to, I want to get to this slide, okay, before we end. So let's interpret what this model has done. This model um, gives us an equilibrium outcome, right? So we have the equilibrium of a game that leads to inequality. So we have some workers who are earning higher wages than other workers, right? That's what we have ultimately in this model. Why are some workers earning higher wages than other workers? It's because of information asymmetries, right? It's because they, the only way that they can signal that they're high sociability types is to suppress their level of education, and therefore they're going to get lower wages. But it's lower than they would have done in a complete information case. So it's rational for people to, to get lower education if they're highly sociable because they like hanging out. There's that labor, there's that schooling versus leisure trade-off. But this is yet a suppression below that level, right? Are you with me? So it's because of information asymmetries. Now here's why one can argue as to whether or not this is an identity model. So it's not an identity model the way um, George Akerlof and I are describing identity. Because there's nothing in this model, per se, that says this is about African Americans. Okay? There's, right, there's nothing that tells us that this is African Americans and not white kids or Hispanic kids or any other kinds of kids. And so I should be able to predict this phenomena for any ethnic or racial group. So if you actually think about what I've done so far, I haven't said anything about whether this is African Americans or not, right? This labor leisure trade-off for sociability versus non-sociability types in the peer group should be true for anybody, for any social group. 
right, for any set of friends. So if I'm looking for there's no liquidity constraints. There's no liquid. Well, okay, so exactly, perfect. So in the model thus far, there's nothing that tells me this is a particular group within society. There's maybe one thing. There's a parameter in this model that could be varied, and it's the value of accepting or rejecting an individual from the peer group. So if you go back to the peer group's utility, right, there's a value, V under bar, it's V bar or V under bar, I forget whether where the bar is, okay? That value you might be able to move around. Okay? So then, wait, so then you'd have to, if you want to make, so I, here's where you might want to, here's where I think you could transform this into a, more of an identity model along the lines that George and I are pushing, is that V bar may come from something about the norms or the community or how people value hanging around with friends, right? Mm -hmm. And then if you say some people value more hanging around with friends than other people, and that has some relationship to the social context, well, now we're starting to actually build an identity model. So, okay, go ahead. So are, are you continually uh, criticizing the model because it's notion of identity is that it's restricted race or gender? I mean, like, we see these types of now within the funding as well. I don't know if this is the best model to describe it. Right, well, so it's a bit, it, so I. Well, I, I think it's the way the model is sold. It's all about how the model is sold. It's, this is sold as a model of African-American underachievement. Right, that's how it's sold. I think that it is a model, say, of this phenomenon of a white kid not wanting to show they're smart because they want to hang out with their friends, possibly. That, but that's in some sense the point. And so what I think, again, this is a very valuable model. I think the idea that there can be multiple audiences, there can be a two audience signaling problem is really cool. I like that. It's really very interesting that you may only be able to signal your underlying characteristics through one variable, or sort of through one choice. That's, that's really nice. So what I'm pushing is the idea is that we want to, if we want to explain this as, as exp if we want to now start to explain the differences we see among different communities, then we have to add more. And this might be one way to possibly do it in the context of this model, is to play around with, with the peer group. Or now you might want to embellish the liquidity constraints or something about the wages or discrimination in the labor market. Right, so we need to think about those payoffs. Yeah. What about applying this model to, let's say, the uh, from Appalachia, like from Appalachia, where, you know, it's not about the peer group, Mm -hmm. And if somebody you know who gets uh, higher education is maybe rejected at, from, you know, by the community, if somebody goes to college, you know, goes to the X and so on. And so what about implementation of such? Yeah, no, I think it would fit actually a lot of these situations because now this kid who actually is goes off to college and then they have no place to go home to because when they go home, people are like, "Who are you?" Right? But again, it's it's all within this peer group utility. Right, and so that's exactly what I want to explore. So I guess, the, I, I, I mean, in some sense I'm saying I like the model very much. But I think to get to these differences, you know, to understand what's going on with any particular community, we have to understand what's going on behind these payoffs. Right, why for some, you know, communities it's okay to go off to college and not. So it, this is one place that we might be able to bring this to some of the notions that George and I are going to push. And so I'll show you some of those models after break. But there was one question, then we'll, then we'll stop. Emphasizing that like these different communities are in some sense the same, 
they're just kind of like facing different, different. I guess to use sociology language, they're facing different structures. Mm -hmm. um, and in that, in that instance, it's kind of like emphasizing like their like fundamental commonality. Yeah. Um, and yeah. so you're, you're kind of pushing this as a bug that is that there's nothing kind of intrinsic that says in the community. But you could kind of add in things that would make it different communities. Well, that's what I want to see. Uh, I'd, I'd like to see that. Okay. And, and then what I want to see is those things that are different about these different communities. I want to understand what they are. Right. So in some sense, in some sense, I completely agree with you. The idea, what's, what's very nice is to say, look, there's nothing special about African Americans. You know, they're just interested in hanging out with their friends just like anyone else. Right. But I'm not sure that's the way it's posed. And, right, and so, but if that's true, right, then why empirically do we actually see these big differences? So if empirically we see these big differences, we actually have to build something in our model <coughs> that gives us these differences, and that's not here. So now I have to think about where do I start putting those in this model, and here I'm giving you one place I might be able to put that in this model. Okay? And now when we come back from break, I'm going to give you sort of models that actually take those differences by the horns. Well, on that wonderful note, yeah, absolutely. <laughs> right.